Hi everyone, this is Tim Formosa. I'll be the facilitator for your first TBL in medical school next week. Uh, I will also be the co-director for the first course that you take after Foundations, Molecule Cells and Cancer, next January, so we'll meet again. Today I'm here to talk about cell biology, uh, and this may look like things that you learned as an undergraduate. Why is this different? Uh, while we're in medical school, we want to focus on things uh, that end up having human pathology related to them. So in order to understand how things go wrong, we need to understand how they were supposed to work in the first place. So we're going to start off with some normal cell biology, but in this case we're going to relate it to understanding how cystic fibrosis uh, is diagnosed and treated and why different people with different mutations are treated differently. So that'll be the subtext uh, as we talk about cell biology, uh, and we'll try in every case to relate this back to, to uh, some pathological condition that you need to understand the cell biology in order to, uh, to diagnose or treat. So this is what a typical eukaryotic cell looks like and some of the components of it. Hopefully you've seen some of these things before. Uh, the question we want to focus on today is, how did I get here? How, how did these organelles get constructed? How did those proteins make their way uh, to the surface of this cell? How are the things on the surface of the cell helpful for recognizing what kind of a cell this is? How do the neighbors know what kind of a cell this is? When we're undergoing embryology, all the neighbors have to look at each other and figure out what they're supposed to do. How do they do that? How do they recognize each other? What are the markers at the surface of the cell that help them with that? Uh, so that's the question for today. How are proteins made, modified, and transported to their appropriate locations uh, so that they can perform their functions properly? This slide is here just to point out the fantasy of there being a typical eukaryotic cell. Uh, the cells in your body, each of the 50 trillion cells that make up you, are different. Each one is unique and has a particular function. They will organize themselves into similar cells in tissues, and you'll talk about some of those tissues during foundations, but each of those cells then can be quite distinct. So we can have things like macrophages over here that crawl and ruffle and move along surfaces. We can have neurons that can be a, a meter or more long. So cells don't necess aren't necessarily microscopic. They can be very large things, and we have to think about transport in that case. That's going to be different. Making your way around inside a very small cell and making your way along a meter-long cell are going to be different processes and have different challenges. <laughs> Muscles like this, uh, the little blue dots, uh, are the nuclei of multiple different cells. So it looks like a single cell because a bunch of cells have fused together and they've maintained uh, their nuclei. So a, a muscle cell isn't a cell at all. It's a syncytium of a whole bunch of different cells. Uh, and then they line up next to each other, like these guys over here, and they make junctions with each other, and that's how muscles work. They have to pull on something in order to make mechanical work happen. So all these cells are very different in shape and function. How do they get to be that way? And here I've made a little summary slide that summarizes everything you need to know about cell biology for medical school. Convenient, huh? So it looks a little bit overwhelming at first, uh, but we'll walk through this and, and go through each of the steps a little bit more carefully, and hopefully this will provide you a nice uh, overview and summary that you can refer back to later for studying that really does, I think, put together all the concepts of things going on inside of a cell uh, that you need to, to know about in, in terms of, of sorting and normal physiology. All right, so first, in, in this first video, we're going to just talk about how proteins get made uh, and then folded in the cytoplasm and sent off to a couple of different places. We'll talk about vesicular trafficking, so we're going to stick over here with this part. We'll talk about everything down here, all this vesicular trafficking stuff, in a second uh, video after this one. All right, so let's keep it simple at first and just talk about how proteins get made. Uh, most of the molecular biology you need to know is also on this slide, but we'll return to 
uh, some more complex topics later in molecule cells and cancer. Uh, but what you need to know today is DNA gets transcribed into RNA and the RNA gets sent out of the nucleus uh, so that it can be translated by ribosomes. Uh, and that's what we need to know uh, about molecular biology for today. So what happens to those proteins after that? Well, the process of making a, a, a linear polymer, the protein, uh, is only the first step. We've got this series of amino acids, and then they have to fold up into a tertiary structure, secondary structures, tertiary structures, quaternary structures, in order to do their job. How does that work? Well, it's kind of a mystery. Uh, there's a lot known about, about how it happens, uh, but we really don't understand the process well. It should take uh, much longer than it does, uh, but proteins fold. So a miracle occurs and we get the protein to fold. There are going to be things that help, uh, like chaperones, that, that will help the proteins fold. And we'll talk about a couple of the chaperones that work in the endoplasmic reticulum in the second video. But for now, we're just going to assume that a protein uh, sequence, the linear sequence of the amino acids, allows the protein to fold. There are some guiding principles that are important. Uh, hydrophobic amino acids form the core of globular domains. So these guys are trying to get away from water, and they're going to all form a little no-water club in the middle of the protein. Uh, hydrophilic or charge residues tend then to be exposed at the surface so that this protein can roll around in an aqueous environment uh, without too much trouble. So hydrophobic at the center, hydrophilic at the surfaces. Why do we care? Because we're going to see that mutations will reverse the character of the region, and that's going to cause trouble. If I put a charged amino acid into what should be the hydrophobic core, it's no longer hydrophobic and it won't fold properly. So that's what we're going to see with some of the mutations, say in cystic fibrosis in the CFTR protein, if we put the wrong kind of amino acid, a missense mutation, into the wrong place, then we're going to disrupt folding, and things won't go well. We can't transport things that won't fold, uh, so that, that's going to cause problems with getting them to their final destination and having them function. Even if the mutations don't affect the functional parts of the protein, they may affect its ability to fold, and that's going to be a serious problem. The example that I'm showing down here at the bottom is a histone, uh, which not only has to fold, so it has to get synthesized and folded, but it can't fold properly because it has to form this quaternary structure with a bunch of other histones, and that can't happen until it gets all back into the nucleus with four of its friends uh, and the DNA, and then folds to make a nucleosome. So protein folding can be a very serious issue, uh, but it's nearly always uh, a difficult process. Uh, it can just get more and less difficult. Speaking of translation problems, I see that the slide that I so meticulously made has lost parts of itself. Uh, it's not important. We've got a ribosome that was sitting over here, and our mRNA has gone askew. The point is, the protein is made in a denatured, unfolded form. It has to then find its secondary structure, fold up into a native tertiary structure, and if that doesn't happen, uh, in, in between, these folding intermediates can glom onto each other, uh, and that's going to cause things like amyloid fibril formation, uh, and we'll talk more about that in brain and behavior in year two. Uh, but the, the point is, most proteins are very near denaturation. It's a, the, the amount of energy difference between the unfolded form and the folded form is really quite small, only a couple of kilocalories per mole. So things folding is unlikely, and unfolding is likely, and all sorts of bad things can happen in between. So uh, 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 folding is a relatively... Uh, tenuous process is my point. All right, so different things have to end up in different places. They might need to go into the nucleus. They might need to go to mitochondria. They might need to go any of a variety of other places. Uh, how do they know where to go? How does the cell sort these things out? 
The answer is there are signals. Uh, there are signals that say, okay, if you have this amino acid sequence, don't worry about what the single letter code, you can go look it up if you want. Uh, this, this just uh, says that if you have these lysines and arginines, these basic amino acids in the center, that's a signal that says, take me to the nucleus. So you have a nuclear localization signal. There are other signals that are at the end termini of proteins that say, I'm supposed to go into the mitochondria, or uh, I'm supposed to go into the endoplasmic reticulum and get sorted uh, through vesicular trafficking. So part of the signal is uh, there are amino acid sequences. As they are translated into amino acids, that signal then gets recognized and says, oh, I see where you're supposed to go. Uh, let me take you there. All right, so let's talk about these first two guys, the nucleus and the mitochondria first, because in these cases, the protein actually gets synthesized in the cytoplasm and then taken to those places. But everything is completed folded, and then taken off to a new place. The other guys we'll talk about in the second video have a more complicated uh, series of steps. And here's what a nuclear localization signal does. If I take something like pyruvate kinase that's supposed to be in the cytoplasm, but I attach to it a signal, there's that lysines and arginines, this, this basic uh, set of amino acids, if I attach that to pyruvate kinase, it says, okay, I was supposed to go into the nucleus, and here I am going into the nucleus. So here's what nuclear localization looks like. Cytoplasmic distribution all out here, not in the nucleus. And I put a nuclear localization signal on, and now it doesn't know any better. It goes into the nucleus. Uh, it won't be functional there, but I have tricked it into thinking that's where it belongs by putting a nuclear localization signal on it. So here's the nuclear pore. It's responsible for that gating, so it won't let anything into the nucleus or pull every, anything out of the nucleus. It's looking for that signal, and it says, okay, you're out here in the cytoplasm, but you have a nuclear localization signal. I will recognize that and let you through and now you'll be in the nucleus. Or conversely, if you're sitting in the nucleus and I find a nuclear export signal on you, I will recognize that and send you out back into the cytoplasm. So this is a gate. Things that are very small can go through. There's, there's actually holes in the gate. Things that are the size of proteins, though, can pass through if they have the appropriate recognition signal on them. They don't have to unfold. Uh, so this is one of the transport, one of the few transport mechanisms that allows a protein that is folded to remain folded and let it pass through. All right, so that's the nuclear pore, nuclear export, and localization. And that's this process over here. Here's our ribosome translating our protein. That protein gets folded, and then the protein goes through the gate back into the nucleus. So there's the nuclear pore. We can also synthesize that protein, have it fold, and go off to the mitochondria. But in this case, it has to get through the mitochondrial membrane. And for that, it needs to unfold and refold. So this guy got synthesized, went through all the trouble of folding, making sure it could work, and then it has to unfold again. And there are a couple of places it can either end up here outside the inner part of the mitochondria or inside the inner part of the mitochondria. You'll talk about a lot of proteins that do functional biochemistry in here with Dr. Lindsley as we talk about intermediary metabolism. Uh, this is how things have to get into the mitochondria in, in order to work, is synthesized in the cytoplasm, unfolded, refolded. All right, so those are the two sorts of fates where we synthesize things in the cytoplasm. The other branch to this is going to go through vesicular trafficking, and we'll talk more about it in the second video.